Okay, it's Wednesday afternoon, November 15th. We're picking up in Bereshit, chapter 29, Making Progress. We're joining Yaakov Jacob on his journey, as we said in verse 1 that we studied last week. He set out on his journey. Remember, he had light feet now. He knew the Lord was with him. He was going in that encouragement and the strength. And he went all the way to the land of the people of the east. We talked last week about how that's put on arm. It's near Haran, that it would, he would have gone northward from Israel towards Syria, and then he would have, if you're facing the map, turned right, okay, mm -hmm. and went toward um, the Euphrates. The Euphrates is a good landmark that a lot of people know where to find that on the map. So this, and probably the people of the east refer to people who lived east of the Euphrates River, because remember, Abraham crossed over. That's where we get the name Hebrew, that double meaning, literally crossed over the river, but crossed over from idolatry into worship of the one true and living God only. His family obviously had that truth within them, but there was idolatry all around them. Now with Yaakov, Jacob in Haran, in the area that, that's near the Euphrates, he's going to be a type of Israel in the present dis, uh, dispersion that she is in now. I heard one of the speakers at the rally refer to herself as one of the Jewish people in the diaspora. I'm talking about the um, rally at Capitol, uh, on Capitol Hill that took place on Tuesday the 14th. And I thought, how right she is. Those of us who are not in the land are the diaspora. We're still out of that land. And Yaakov is a, a picture of this. Let me explain how. This is where I started last week, but we're picking it back up with that. He was out of the place of blessing now. Remember God told Abraham to go to the land. He would bless him there in that land. He promised him in Genesis 12. Then he promised um, uh, Jacob's father Isaac in Genesis 26. And he promised Jacob in 28. Blessing, prosperity in that land. But in that land being at that time called Canaan or Canaan. It's what we call the promised land. But right now he's out of that land he's out of where the blessings of god are flowing but that does not mean he's going to be out of blessing when we are out of a place because we're following the will of the lord he is with us he's going to bless jacob there but remember yaakov jacob made that um pledge a sincere pledge that when God blessed him and brought him back into the land, he would give a tenth of all that God had blessed him with. So he was expecting to be blessed. He was not expecting to be in poverty and in suffering, etc., etc. Uh, again, that doesn't mean if you have a time of need that you're out of the will of God because he uses our time of needs to grow us. But I think you understand what I'm saying. He's now in a place where there's idolatry around. He's without an altar. Remember, he made an altar to the Lord right there where he had that dream where he saw the, the ladder that connected heaven to earth. And we saw that that was a picture literally of Yeshua Jesus, or symbolically, I should say, not literally. But you know what I'm trying to say. The altar was the place of God's presence. Yaakov knew that night when he had that dream that, it, that and God spoke to him at the top of the ladder and spoke verbally in that dream to him. He knew God was in that place. When Avram made his altar and worshipped his God, he knew God was there with him. And now, we, as we carry it down, we would see in our, the history of our people in the tabernacle, they knew God dwelt with them at the Holy of Holies place, in the temple we saw it also. This, in essence, is uh, Yaakov being um, removed from that place. And yet, we're going to see God is with him also. But it's a picture of our people with no temple now. They don't have that place where they know that's where God is and that's where I can go dwell with God and be right, right with him. During this time also, they were hated by the Gentiles who were jealous of them. Now, we're going a little bit ahead, but if I take you to chapter 31, you're going to see in Genesis 31 that... This is where, how Jacob is going to be treated. In 31 verses 1 and 2, it says, Jacob heard the words of Laban's sons, saying, Jacob has taken away all that was our father's, and from what belonged our father, he has made all this wealth. And Jacob saw the attitude of Laban, Laban, and behold, it was not friendly toward him, 
as it had been before. So he's going to have a time where it's good, but he's going to have a time where he knows it's turned against him, that he's going to be hated by those he's surrounded with, and that's very true of our Jewish people even to this day. Even so, and even though, they are under the covenant care of God. And we saw that in Genesis chapter 28. Go back with me real quick. And we see that God promised to, uh, to Jacob, even though he's having to go away from his home, go away from Canaan, he promised him in Genesis 28 and verse 13, this is the Lord standing above him on that ladder saying, I am. Yes, behold. Thank you. Good for the Loretto. Don't miss it. There's four beholds in that ladder drink. Four times. That's amazing. That's hello, 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 hello. <laughs> so behold, the Lord was standing above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, the God of Yitzhak, Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your descendants. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. You will spread out west, east, north, and south, and in you and your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you. I will keep you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I've done what I have promised you. What a promise to Yaakov. If he were being judged by God and going out of because of his own sin, then there would not be this blessing given. It may not have been that, that he did everything the right way that got him to that place, but God had not forsaken him, not taken away his promise to him because God is not one who takes back his promises. And he is assuring uh, Yaakov that even though you're going out of the land of promise, I will be with you and I will give you this land and your descendants are going to be, go all over the face of the earth. We know that to be true. And that uh, the blessing would come to all the families of the earth. And that is through his seed. And we know that literally is Messiah who blesses all with the gift of salvation. So uh, they're going to know and see and understand that God's covenant care for them has not been rescinded. Even when they have not done right. Okay, well, we'll welcome Emily in. And... Hi, girl. Shadow, we know her. We know her. <laughs> welcome. Shalom. And we see also that Sh oh, Paul tried to reassure our people of this in Romans 11, chapter um, 11, verse 1, and then we'll pick up at verse 25. Verse 1, show Paul speaking. He's in chapters 9, 10, and 11. He's been given Israel history. Ninth, chapter 9 was Israel past. Chapter 10 was Israel in the present. And chapter 11 will deal with Israel's future. So having just dealt with the present of Israel's situation and looking toward the future, in verse 1 he said, I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be, for I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin, of the tribe of Benjamin. So Shaul Paul is saying, I'm a Jew, I've come down through this line, obviously the Lord has not forsaken the line, his, his people, and he never will. Go down now to verse 25. Okay, we've got sound effects. <laughs> verse 25 says, I don't want you, brethren, to be uninformed. I always have to laugh because in the old King James, where you read this, it says, I would not have you ignorant, brethren. Where are you? Romans yeah. 11. Oh, Romans? Romans 11. Oh. I read okay. verse 1, and I'm dropping down to verse 25. And while they're looking it up and getting on the right page, the, the King James Version says, I would not have you ignorant, brethren. And Dr. McGee, a very famous Bible teacher, highly respected in heaven for years now, said it's very important where you put your pauses. Because he could read that and say, I would not have you, ignorant brethren. <laughs> or I would not have you, ignorant brethren. <laughs> Big difference. Shaul Paul reaching out to, to fellow believers and saying, I don't want you uninformed of this mystery so that you won't be wise in your own estimation. He's talking to the Gentiles who could think, well, the Jews blew it. They rejected. We got it now. We've come in. It's all ours. He's saying, no, 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 no. There's 
there's been this mystery. They didn't even know about the, what we call the church age or the body of, of Christ, the body of Messiah, beforehand. That was not told in the original scriptures to the nation of Israel because it's not what God is doing with the nation of Israel. So he's saying, don't be wise in your own estimation. A partial happen, a hardening I'm sorry, has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Israel has partially hardened her heart against her God, against her Messiah. In that gap, God has brought in the Gentile people. It's the tree, in the tree, the roots are, are the, the limbs, I'm sorry, are Jewish, and grafted in now is the Gentiles to the same root, which is Yeshua Jesus. But Paul's saying, don't think God's replaced the tree. Don't think he's replaced, cut off all those branches. No, you've been grafted in. He's made room for you. There's a partial hardening that's opened the Gentiles' eyes so that they can see. And I'm going to, and I'm, this part's not in here or here, but it is in other scriptures. I'm going to use the Gentiles to provoke the Jewish people to jealousy so they'll want to come back into what they had that they weren't valuing. That's what's going on. But realize it's a partial hardening that's happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. When the fullness of the Gentiles, those who are going to be saved, has come in, then that time is complete, and God will go on with his plan with Israel as if there had never been an interruption. You can kind of do it like a parenthesis in his plan with Israel. That at this moment in time, his focus is not on Israel being lifted up to being head nation. He's building his body of Christ. When he's completed this body, when he uh, when that has ended, then he will go back on in bringing Israel to that point where she will be a head nation of the world. The world will be all the families blessed through Messiah who will rule and reign on earth. But if you ask me right now, is this earth right now in the time of the Jews? Then I'll tell you absolutely not. You don't, do not see Jewish rulership. You do not see Jewish favor. Look at poor little Israel right now, who they want to take away the slice of land that is hers. There's so many more Arab territories around her, and yet they want her one slice of the pie. And like it was also said at the rally and by Golda Meir and by so many others, we have one home as a Jew, just that little bit called Israel. We cannot give that away, then there's nowhere for the Jew. We may live in our own houses, but we have one home. God has said this is a partial hardening until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. When, when Gentile rule ends, that means Jewish rule begins. Jewish rule does not begin until Messiah is sitting on the earth in the earth, on the the throne of David is what I'm trying to say in Jerusalem. That's when the times of Gentiles have completely ended and you have God's program with Israel <laughs> continuing on. But God being faithful, you could say there's a pause in that Jewish world of role that's supposed to come. I, I, I'm pausing because it wasn't like it was there. But God had the plan through the Jew from the beginning is what I'm trying to say. and saying it so poorly today. Sorry, folks. But it will go on. And verse 26 makes it clear. And so all Israel will be saved. Now that's talking about the national land of Israel. That doesn't mean that every Jewish person's got an in. They got it. You know, they don't have to accept the Lord. They just, they're in because they're Jewish. No. Every Jewish person, just like every Gentile, has to personally accept Yeshua Jesus as Lord, as Savior, as Messiah, to be part of God's family. No one's just got an automatic in. If so, then, then God did a disservice with Yeshua Jesus having to shed his innocent blood, because there wouldn't be a need for it. But there is for every single one. So here we're seeing it speak to the nation being saved. Remember Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10, Zechariah says that they will finally look at me whom they pierced. They'll mourn for me as one mourns for their only son. They'll realize that they, they missed the, who was their Messiah. They'll accept him as Messiah. And he comes when they say, Baruch HaBaba Shemadonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And verse 26 here in Romans 11 tells us that. Just as it is written, 
the deliverer, the redeemer, the rescuer will come from Zion. Zion is Zion, that's the name for Israel. He will remove ungodliness. He will remove sin from Jacob, Yaakov. This is, now it's God speaking, this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. When God removes sin from the, the nation, he is establishing Israel as that head nation, ruling and reigning as King Messiah, where he will keep sin in check. This is when there has been that total change. We've come through the tribulation. Those going into the kingdom are those who are believers, Jewish believers and Gentile believers that will come into the beginning of the kingdom and start the kingdom with them. But that comes when Messiah returns, comes to Zion, comes out of Zion, stops the battle, sets up his kingdom, and the world will finally know Shalom. So... Paul makes it very, very clear. That's Israel's future. And I preach that to Israel today. You will not be annihilated by Hamas. You have been hurt. You have been cut to the core in your heart. Your heart is shattered. Someone, one of the hostages, mother said, we have third degree burns on our soul. And I thought that that's yeah. one way to put it. Yes. I mean, we, we hurt very, very deeply that God has given Israel a resilience and an ability to continue on because he is faithful, because he promised there would never be an end. And so he will not allow Hamas or any of the other enemies of Israel to wipe her off the face of this earth. And our hope is in this tragedy, more come to know their God, more come into that relationship and look to the Messiah, their Savior, for personal salvation now national salvation to come in time. So, very relevant to today. Great picture. Yaakov is out of the land. God's going to bring him back to the land. Israel goes out of her land because of, of sinfulness, because of disobedience, but God brings her back into the land. God has put her back in the land today. She has a schmidge of her geographic location knows it's a schmidge <laughs> it's a part <laughs> but he missing. is already yes yeah, something's missing <laughs> he's already drawing hearts from around the world to go back he's already begun that process but you will see it fully and completely as time moves on and his perfect plan is unveiled but while they're out of the land so to speak and there's still so many out of the land today the land has been occupied during that time by who the Bible called Edomites, E-D-O-M, Edomites. Those are Arabs who hated Israel. And we see this, that the Edomites came from Esau. Okay, they descend from Jacob's brother. Where do I get that? And by the way, Esau is at a state right now of hating Jacob in our story. So there is your hatred that carries also. Go back with me to Genesis 36, and you'll see there. I mean, what a picture. This was happening thousands of years ago, but it's happening right now, too. So relevant. So relevant. We take a page out of the Bible, and we open up our newspaper, and we're reading the same thing. Genesis 36 and verse 1 says, Now these are the records of the generations of Esau, that is, Edom. So Esau became known as Edom. And here are his generations, his progeny, his those who came from him. Drop down to verse 27. You can read it all later. But drop, drop down to verse 27. Um, actually, no. Let me take you, I'm sorry. Let me take you to chapter 27 and verse 41. Because you can read all of, of the descendants on your own. They're a mouthful to say, but they are... Um, the Edomites, and the Edomites came from Esau, and that is who the Arab line is from today. Go back to chapter 27, Genesis 27, and we'll look at verse 41. Genesis 27 and verse 41. Genesis 27, 41 says, I'll get there. <laughs> so Esau bore a grudge against Jacob. Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, The days of mourning for my father are near, then I will kill my brother Jacob. So that same hatred that Esau had in his heart 
went down through the Edomite line of the Arab people that hate Israel to this day. Now, that doesn't mean every Arab, but it's the line and the peoples that we're talking about right now. When we talk about the enemy of Israel, we call them Hamas. They are of Arab descent. But there are many Arabs, Israeli Arabs and Arabs that have been living elsewhere that want to live in peace with Israel. We are not wiping out a whole people in a sentence. We know that there is a difference there. But the Edomites, the Arab nations, are at war with the Jewish nation repeatedly through our history. Just absolutely repeatedly. It's two lines, one that was godly, one that was not. Esau did not care about the spiritual part of the blessing and the birthright. All he cared about was, I want land, I want all the goods, I want the wealth, I want for myself. I could go on, but we talked about that when we were there. Ultimately, Yaakov, Jacob, will be brought back to the land. Ultimately, we will see all of Israel living in Israel. That will come in millennial time. It will not come before, because we have at the end of the tribulation time, the beginning of the millennium, we have that God says, he sends his angels to the four corners of the earth to bring them back. We have the Jews coming every which way as they come back into their land and, and the Gentiles supporting them and helping them, carrying them, carrying them on their shoulders, in, in their cars, on their donkeys, I mean, in every way that you can think of. But chapter 31 and verse 3, we're almost there in, in our study, um, tells us that the Lord said to Yaakov, Return to the land of your fathers and to your relatives, and I will be with you. So Yaakov was sent out by God's will. He's just now arrived in Haran. It's going to be very interesting what happens to him, and we're going to get a whole 20 years of his life in the next two chapters. <laughs> but then God <clears throat> sends him back. God told him to go back to the land and that God would be with him. Chapter 35. And of course, when we get to these chapters, we'll take it all in detail. I'm just giving you the overall picture right now. Uh, read verses 1 through 7. Let me read at least the beginning for you. Uh, 35, 1. Then God, Elohim, said to Yaakov, Arise up, well, sorry, arise, go up to Baal, Bethel. Remember where he said it's the house of God? That's where he saw the ladder. That's where he took the stone and anointed it, set up a pillar, and said, I want to make an altar here, I want to come back to this place. God's now telling him, go back, live there, make an altar to, to God, who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau, what we just talked about. So Yaakov, Jacob said to his household, and all who were with him, put away your foreign gods which are among you. Sounds like probably what Ophram told his family when they had to go out. Put away those idols, we're leaving those behind. Purify yourselves, change your garments, arise, go up to Bethel, Bethel. I will make an altar there to God who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. He never felt forsaken by the Lord. The Lord was with him. So they gave to Yaakov all the foreign gods which they had, the rings which were in their ears, and Yaakov hid them under the oak which was near Shechem. They journeyed. There was a great terror on the cities. Uh, go down to verse 6, so Yaakov comes to Luz, that is Bethel, Bethel, in the land of Canaan. He and all the people were with him. He built an altar there, and he called the place El Bethel, God, the house of God, because there God had revealed himself to him when he fled from his brothers. So just like God had said, you'll go out, but I'll bring you back, and God did it. Now, in our day, we see Hezekiel, Ezekiel 37. And we see how what happened with Yaakov foreshadowed what's happening even in our day and age. In chapter 37 of the book of Hezekiel, Ezekiel, we have in the first verse, the hand of the Lord, the hand of Adonai was upon me. He brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, out by the Ruch HaKodesh. He set me down in the middle of the valley and it was full of bones. Okay, if you read it, you'll know those are dead men bones in this valley where God has brought Hezekiel. Now, go down to verses 21 to 23 you, and read all of chapter 37. It's thrilling. But in verse 21, God, God's speaking. Okay, say to them, thus says the Lord God, thus says Adonai Elohim, 
Behold, <laughs> I will take the sons of Israel from among the nations where they have gone. I will gather them from every side. I will bring them into their own land. I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel. Does anyone know where the mountains of Israel are? In Israel. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> in Israel. Where we find Israel today? In Israel. in Israel. <laughs> okay. I will bring them in one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel and one king will be king for all of them. There will no longer be two nations because we know in Israel's history the kingdom divided. They will no longer be divided into two kingdoms. Verse 23, they will no longer defile themselves with their idols or detestable things. It goes on uh, because God has cleansed them and they will be my people and I will be their God. Now, has Israel cleansed herself of all her idolatry and all the detestable things that are going on? No. So obviously we're living right between those verses. God has brought her back. She will, in, in a, a day, there will be a day when she will completely have purged from her the sin of the people. She will turn to her God. She will see the, her Redeemer. She will have her faith in the Lord coming out of Zion, rescuing his people, and setting up his kingdom. Right now, if you read earlier in chapter 37, God asked Ezekiel, can these dead bones live? And Ezekiel says, I don't know, can they? <laughs> and God says, I will put my spirit in them. I will bring them back to life. Individually, we see that happening for every believing Jewish person right now. I being one. I didn't save myself. God put his spirit in me. God brought life to me. But we will see it for those living in the land who are with the ounce right now. There will be those who will come to that saving faith. They're the ones who are the bones that come back to life who will see and continue to, to be blessed and be those who God calls his people. He'll be their God. He'll set up his role, and it will continue forever. So Hamas, you're arguing with God. Mm -hmm. The fact that you want to take Israel's land that you want to wipe out the Jewish race is really the, the plan, the, the attempt, better word than plan, the attempt of your leader, who is Satan. That's who's behind this. Satan wants to dethrone God, wants to set up his own kingdom, wants his own power on this earth. <clears throat> he wants it worldwide. He's going to work through the Antichrist to even try to get that then, midway through the tribulation. Mm -hmm. He has the Antichrist put an image of himself in the temple to be worshipped as God. That will cause the Jewish people to flee because they're not going to worship this false idol. They're not going to, to uh, accept his ways and he's going to go about to kill them. And the battle goes on until the Lord returns. But this is what's happening even in this very day. This is Satan again attempting right now to wipe the Jewish people off the face of the map. The Messiah has no one to come back to. Wipe out the possibility of a kingdom of Israel. Wipe out God's plan and put himself on that throne and say, you're going to worship me. And I say, hallelujah, we have nothing to fear. He will never succeed. He will go down in defeat. And I praise God because can you imagine the control of Satan on this earth without the power of God coming against it? It would be the most, it would be hell. That's, that's, that's the, without cussing, that's what it would be. Literally, it would be hell. Hallelujah, that will never happen. Here's God's promise. Yaakov, I've got my hand on you. Even when I have to take you out of the land, even though I will bring you back, I will be your God. And you will be my people. No. He'll go down in flames. Yes, he will go down in flames. I've said it before that way, yes. But having all this in mind now, what a picture we have for our Jewish people to encourage them. We have seen this in our history repeatedly. God is always faithful. And he brings our people through because he promised. Not because they deserve, not because they get it right, not because they do it perfect. But because God is faithful. God made a plan, and he said, through Israel, the rest of the world will be blessed. He didn't leave anybody out. So everyone can be a part of the blessing of God through God's eternal plan. As we go back to chapter 29, 
I want to point out that many think this was a time of, um, I'll call it a punishment for Yaakov, for Jacob, because of, you know, what was going on. They think that um, between his brother and himself, oh, well, Jacob dealt deceitfully. And then what he did with his dad to get the birthright, it was such horrible deceit that this is Jacob's punishment. Well, I would not mind a punishment where I get a vision of my God who's speaking directly to me and encouraging me that he's with me and that he's taking me to a place to, to be with me and to bring me back. That That's pretty wonderful. That's not you know, what I would call judgment. And during this time, and it is going to be 20 years before he comes back, for the most part, they are prosperous years for Yaakov, for Jacob, and, and the happy years. Yes, Levon is going to treat him shabbily, but he does give Yaakov a job. He does permit him to marry his two daughters. <laughs> she didn't want and, <laughs> well, he wanted one of them. <laughs> and really, he gets a chance to begin to build up what is his wealth, what is his livelihood, and what is for him. Is so if this is judgment from God, it seems a little strange to me that it goes the way it goes. Okay? okay. Yes? What's the, the rule back then, the, you had to marry the dog, first daughter first that came, then the second daughter second, or was that just a... Levon says that. <laughs> now, if it was prevalent and well-known and the only way, well, why wasn't Jacob aware? And mean. if you say, okay, well, <laughs> Jacob wasn't aware because he was a stranger, wasn't, you know, the ways of the land, which could possibly be, then wouldn't it have been the responsibility of Levon to say, well, I can't give you the hand of my daughter, Raphael, because I have to give you the old, or the, I have to marry off the oldest first. But he doesn't tell him. Yeah. He doesn't present it. It's, you know, not prevalent enough that those around would know it and say something. I mean, have you ever tried to keep a secret in a family? <laughs> like he wants to get rid of her. Almost, you know? It doesn't work. What? Almost like he wants to get rid of her. Yeah. Well, there's two sides <coughs> to that, <laughs> whether he felt that this was his only way to deal with it, yeah. you know, whether it was an obscure role. We'll talk about it as we come to it in depth, but I've given you a little bit ahead of time. <laughs> so, Jacob has gone on his journey. He's gone to the right area. And as I said in my reminding text to you today, well, hmm. Well is a deep subject, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I dig it. <laughs> and we've seen the wells that Yitzhak had, and how God worked around the wells spiritually. Mm -hmm. Well, very interesting because as Yaakov has come into Haran, come into the land to the sons of the east, he looked and he saw a well. He saw a well in the field, and behold, <laughs> three flocks of sheep were lying beside it. For from them, for I'm sorry, for from that well they watered the flocks. Okay, let me back up and let me tell you why I'm emphasizing well. We see the hints of the wells being something spiritual that we've already started we're with. Verse it's all right. We're we're really on verse two. Okay. <laughs> I read most of two, but we're really on <coughs> verse two. He saw a well. Why are we being told that? What's important about the well? I'm going to take you fast forward and I'm going to let you see, go all the way to the Brita the New Covenant, to John, Yochanan, John 4 and verse 4. Because there's another well there and that well just happens to be Jacob's well. <laughs> Some of you know the story. Yeah. Yeah. Yochanan, John 4, and actually I said 4, but try 14. I'm sorry, folks, I'm, I'm not doing real good today. John 4, 14, whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst, but the water I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Those were the words of Yeshua to the Samaritan woman at the well. And so what we're seeing symbolically is that the well speaks of, and I'm going to say it again the right way, um, it's, okay, I will give him, 
I got to say, but the water I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. So the well really is representative of eternal life. That when mm -hmm. God puts his spirit in us, he puts a well within us. That well keeps flourishing, keeps nourishing, keeps satiating us. We don't get thirsty. We don't go looking for a cup of water somewhere else. We have it within. As long as we don't stop up our well by squelching the Holy Spirit who's within us, we have this. So the well itself really speaks of Messiah. It speaks of salvation. It speaks of the Spirit of God. And it is alive and should constantly be springing up within us. And we know that the Word is referred to in a very similar way. Look with me at Ephesians chapter 5 and verses 25 and 26. Ephesians 5. 25 and 26 and then we'll go back and we'll see if this well is foreshadowing how this thought develops for us in Ephesians 5 25 husbands love your wives just as Messiah also loved the church and gave himself up for her and just as a freebie side note I will say when you're talking about the husband wife relationship and those who argue about submission and subjection and they can slice the pie every way they want but I will guarantee you any husband who will willingly lay down his life for his wife who treats her in that way will have no problem with her being under his care and being at his side to be his help me and his completer there will be no battle for a headship it's just a beautiful picture when it's it, it properly done and in order and the problem is many husbands don't love their wives in that way and then wonder why they don't get out of their wives what they think that they should get okay side trip side preach whatever <laughs> Verse 26, that was, for, that free. was for free, yes. <laughs> just for, just threw it in for free. So, that, okay, so love your wives as Christ also loved the church, gave himself up for so he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. So how did the church become clean? Washed with the water of the word. What comes out of a well? Water. So the living word of God cleanses us refreshes us renews us that's what should be constantly springing up it's not that we live perfectly i wish i did but i can't as long as i'm human i should be um, um trying to attain it what do you call it? striving i should be striving for that but no matter how good i try to be i sin without even knowing i've sinned let alone the sins i do that i you know am made aware of but i have this constant washing, renewing, refreshing. My sins have been washed away. It's a beautiful picture. The well speaks well of Messiah and of his word and what it can do within us. Uh, Titus 3, 5 says, Read Not for the works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So how does he wash and regenerate and renew us by yeah. his Holy Spirit? By the Word. By the, word, by the, the, the well of salvation being put within us, and that springs up and continually. And it's beautiful. So keep that in mind as we go back to the well in Genesis 29. Sure, we're going now. We're back there we go. We're to back to the other end of the Bible. We're <laughs> back. Yes, we're back to the other end. But notice how it's one continuous story. That's why we can see foreshadowed in the original books what's revealed in the the new in the Brit Hadashah. And this is another case where we really do see that this well we can we can draw a spiritual picture at the same time of it being literal. He did literally see a well. And at that well were three sheep, three flocks of sheep, not three <laughs> sheep's a flock. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, real good today. Three flocks of sheep that were waiting to be watered. And that again, who are we? Are we not called the sheep of his pasture? So here it fits perfectly. Those sheep need to be watered and they need to be refreshed. And we need to be constantly at that well that we be refreshed and renewed and that we grow in in our walk with our lord and if a uh, well is often in scripture associated with god's blessing um, 
I think, and there's no reason for us to think differently, I think we've seen this well before in our scriptures. Now, we're only through 28 chapters, so you don't have far to go back and think, okay? Where did we hear something about a well in this area, in the, in the area of Haran, the area where Opram's family came from? What did we, what did we? Rebecca? Very good. We're going back to chapter 24. We're going back to when the servant went to find a wife for Yitzhak. And he goes to the very same area that Jacob has now come to because they both went back to Abram's family. And he, I think it's Eliezer. Let me just say that because it's easier. But the servant, Eliezer, stops at a well and prays. And before his prayer gets the amen, he's got the wife for Yitzhak. It all comes together. Well, here's the well in that same area where they come for the sheep to be watered. I think very likely Jacob is at the same well that the servant was at. Mm -hmm. Servant got Rivka. Jacob's going to get Rachel. <laughs> okay, so uh, but the, but the, the point being, not yet, right, but the point being God's blessing is there. Now, why three flocks of sheep? If we try to find something symbolically, it could be that it's showing three different <laughs> groups of those who come to believe. And we would say then they're the believing people in the old or the original covenant. We call it the Old Testament, the saints, you know, Abraham, Jacob, you know, and on. And then it could be the believing saints in our day and age in what's called the church age right now. And then the third group would be those who will go into the kingdom, who come through the tribulation in faith. They somehow manage to stay alive and they go into the millennial kingdom. So they're called either tribulation saints or millennial saints. We could look at it that way. And basically what we're saying is from the beginning to the end, God always has those who are followers of him. He always keeps a remnant. He always has, um, he has some sheep. I wish he had all the sheep, but not all are willing. He died for all, but not all are willing to turn to him. Now, I can't tell you dogmatically that's what the three flocks mean, but that's the only idea that I could get. Um, if you've got another idea, you can present it to me later. But um, the idea, at least for here and for right now, what we're looking at is that there were groups already that were there, sheep that needed to be refreshed. Now, What's going on? You've got to know and understand how they acted in those days to get this whole story. But let me read just a little bit more for you. Okay, um, I'm going to pick up in verse 2. That the three flocks of sheep were lying there beside it, beside the well, because they watered the flocks from that well. So all the sheep that are around this area come and get watered at this well. It's it's a main well, obviously. Now the stone, oh, I just shut my tablet, sorry. Mm -hmm. Now the stone on the mouth of the well was large. When all the flocks were gathered there, they would roll the stone from the mouth of the well and water the sheep. Then they would put the stone back on its place on the mouth of the well. Look down real quick at verse 8. We'll go in order, we'll come back up, but look at verse 8 just to get one more little detail to understand. But they said, we cannot until all the flocks are gathered and they roll the stone from the mouth of the well, then we water the sheep. So obviously the way this was done is the shepherds had their sheep out in the fields when it was time, probably most likely toward the end of the day, they would bring their, their flocks toward that well, but they would wait for all the flocks to get in. They wouldn't open and close that well continually. It was a large stone. It was a heavy stone. Usually took two or three people to move the stone, although we're going to see Jacob does it by himself. So either he had some extra power or it's still, it would have been too heavy for young shepherds and shepherdesses, you know. But it seems like there might have even been an ordinance that this is how we do it. We remove the lid at once. We water all the flocks in the order that they came. When they're all done, we put the lid on. Now we've conserved. We're not opening and closing where contamination can get in, where um, the water can evaporate, where we have other issues. It's controlled and it's kept safe and good for the betterment of everyone around. Um, 
it could be everything from evaporating concerns to also the ownership that the, the <coughs> owner of the well just said, hey, this is the way we're going to do it. We open at once, we close at once. We're not going to do it all, you know, haphazardly and, and so forth and so on. So when I go back up to verse 3, when all the flocks would be gathered, then they would roll that stone. Okay, there's three flocks there waiting right now. They would be first, second, third when the stone is moved, but they're waiting right now. Okay, I think I've told you everything you need um, in verse 3. So verse 4, Yaakov, Jacob said to them, okay, he's going to interact with the people who are there. Yes. But don't they have to wait for the owner of the well to come so that they can roll the... If, if the owner was controlling it in that way, they might have to wait, but more likely he would be represented by somebody. You know, that they, they, somebody was there to make sure it was done orderly, but not necessarily for him to come. It just was a matter of when they knew all the, the flocks were there, then they could move the stone. If they did it beforehand, they probably would get reported back to him and get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> if it's the owner's role, if it's not the city ordinance, if it's a city ordinance, they get in trouble by the city. You know, I don't know if this well was particularly owned by one. We're not told, but you know, there was order here anyway. Just basically, there was order. That's the way it's going to be done, and that's what they're going to be told. Or I'm sorry, that's what Jacob's going to be told as we go through the story. Would the wells be, if you're rolling the stone to the, the well, the well would also almost have to be flat. Yes. So they could do that. But could that will keep people from at nighttime walking? Or... <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. It would keep people from falling in accidentally, <laughs> yes. And, and it would keep, you know, you can't leave, I can leave my open glass of water, and if I leave it sitting out all day, I see little floaties <laughs> on top, and I toss that water, you <laughs> yeah. know. Oh, I don't want to drink that. Yeah. So, you know, same idea. This is their source of water for the flocks, for the people, you know, everything here. But there's an order to how things are done. So Yaakov sees them, and he says to them, My brothers, where are you from? And they said, We are from Haran. Okay? Jacob's going to interrogate these, these shepherds. He's going to ask them different, you know, to find out different things. Notice the change when chapter 24, the servant, who I think is Eliezer, he did not interrogate the shepherds. He didn't ask them for information. He made a prayer. He, he directly went for divine guidance and was praying as he waited at that well. He knew people would show up at that well. But as he, he sat there and waited, he turned to prayer. And his prayer was specific, Lord God, you got me here, now help me find my, the wife for my, um, for my master's son, for, for Isaac. Okay, now, when that happened, <coughs> it happened a long time ago. I want you to realize time has passed. There's about a hundred years between Eliezer, the servant, and Jacob. How do I know this? Because Rebecca and uh, Isaac were married 20 years before they had children, remember? Right, right. Okay, Isaac married at 40, he had the twins at 60. And remember we talked about how Jacob is around 76 to 77 years old now. So add 20 years to that because of the time between Rebecca marrying and giving birth to Jacob, it's 96, 97 years ago. But a well will still be a well. I drank out of Jacob's well in 1977. And he dug that well in B.C. around, what? <laughs> I don't want to go back quite as far as 2000 B.C., but close enough. You know, we're looking at, let's just say, 3,500 plus years later, I'm drinking out of the same well. So a well does continue on. But we've got a long time in between. What we see is God's providential hand continually. He guided the servant. The servant looked in a prayer and he guided. Yaakov, we don't hear praise, but we're going to see the divine hand of God once again, that God is guiding Yaakov. Very interesting. Notice how Yaakov and the shepherds could talk to each other. Same language. This would be Aramaic. It wasn't the language of the heathens, of others, other, you know, peoples. But remember, he went back to the family. 
Now, if I went back to my folks' relatives, let's say my dad's relatives that are back east, because we're all family, I'd be able to talk with them. So right away we see he's gone back, not just to Haran, but he has come back to where the family is, and the language communication is still obviously there. So he's able to talk with the, the shepherds, and he asks them, where are you from? And they said, we are from Haran. He thinks, bingo, that's where I need to be because I know that's where my family came from. So he said, do you know, because remember, he was to go to Uncle Levon, Uncle Laban. He was to go to his house. So he said, do you know Levon, the son of Nahor? Nahor and Avraham were brothers. So that's where you get the uncle relationship. And hang on to that. If you're good with relationships, you'll be good. Otherwise, I've got a <laughs> twist for you just to confuse you. But um, he says, do you know Levon? And they said, we know him. And so the next question, in our English it says, is it well with him? In the Hebrew it literally says, how is his peace? And do you know to this day, that's how one Jewish person in Hebrew speaks to another one. They ask, how is your shalom? How is your peace? I just did this with a rabbi I had contact with in Israel less than a week ago. Our first conversation, because I can just do the beginning, I can't get further than that, but our beginning greetings of shalom, and then mashlom chav, mashlom ech, and we both said shalom tov, baruch Hashem. What we just said was, how is your peace? My peace is good, thank the Lord. That's how they talked then, that's how we talk today. I found that very interesting. If you don't, sorry, but anyway, <laughs> we in English do the same thing. Hi, how are you? How are you doing? You know, it's the same so, thing. Yeah. It's just showing you the family relationship and the carrying on of the traditions. Did, um, Jacob marry his cousin? <laughs> yes, it gets even a little more complicated than that. Wait till I tell you, and we should get there. I think so we're getting there real quickly. Laban was, was Jacob's brother, uncle. But he was okay. Rebecca's okay. brother and Leah, uh, Rachel's father. I'll say it to you now, and when we get done with <laughs> verse 12, I'll repeat it, okay? Yeah. Laban is, it ends up being, okay, yeah. Laban being brother to Jacob's mother. Right. Laban being brother to Rebecca. He's also Jacob's uncle. Right. He becomes Jacob's father-in-law. <laughs> and Laban is Jacob's second cousin as well. Because Rachel was Jacob's second cousin once removed, since he and Laban were second cousins. So when I get through all this, if, if you can hold on she to are, it. I'm my own grandfather. Exactly, the song, <laughs> my own, am I, I end up being my own grandfather, yes. And I remember Dave even brought it to us once <laughs> because he's our music man. Uh, but yes, it is uh, that same idea. Laban will be Jacob's second cousin, his uncle, and his father-in-law all at the <laughs> same time. That, that's just a mind blower. <laughs> but yes, you're right there. We're in the family. But... They don't know that yet. So Jacob's asked, how is he? And they said to him, uh, okay, he asked in verse 6, is it well with him? And they said, it is well. And here is his daughter Rachel, his daughter Rachel, coming with the sheep. Okay, Jacob asked, um, you know, how he was, and, and he gets told, oh, he's fine, and, and here comes his daughter. Now, do you think that just happened? Or is this the exact minute timing that we saw with Eliezer when he prayed to God and before he said amen, the answer was there. Yaakov has been sent on mission by God. He is in the will of God and God is bringing him his answer right away. I don't think it's any coincidence that Rachel was there right at the time that Jacob arrives. Um, <coughs> I had a thought and I just lost it. She knocked her socks off. Hmm? She knocked his socks off. Oh, she knocked his socks <laughs> off? Okay. Something like that. Term okay. I, you know, I just, oh, I know what I was thinking. Rachel's out taking care of the sheep. We're going to say it's not the end of the day yet, but she's bringing her sheep in to where they're going to get water. Now, obviously, there are others who did it early, too, because we've already got three flocks sitting there. <laughs> but what made Rachel come then? 
Why didn't she come earlier and she was waiting? Or why didn't she come later and Jacob had to wait? I just see God's <coughs> perfect timing in this. And many a time in our lives, I'm sure you can attest to the same thing. We've seen God move to bring some of us together in some sort of circumstances at just the right moment in time. I could give you, but I don't want to get sidetracked because it's 315, but I could give you the story of a dog where it was critically important that there was a connection and it was God's perfect timing. I could give you the story of a, um, um, oh goodness, what would I call it? It was more than a wallet, but a package that had a man's wallet in it that had been left at a bank at an ATM where my brother and my mother separately just happened to come together at that moment to see that before someone else saw it and absconded. And the owner just happened to be an unsafe Jewish man <laughs> who odd. came to the door to get his belongings and met Mike Pearl. Not quite this close of a cousin, <laughs> but who got to an opportunity and we as a family to be a witness and a lie to him. I could tell you story after story after story. And I'll bet if we went around the room, you would all light up with, yes, this happened in my life too, because that is our God. He's in every second. He's in every minute. He is in the time, whether we see or understand, it doesn't matter. I love to say, and I've brought it out time and again in message, Tick tock, God's clock. <laughs> this is God's clock at work. And I see it and I, I thrill to it. So um, here they come to this very special meeting and we have um, Yako's response, okay? Now, we're going to read between the lines because we don't know exactly, but then he, being Jacob, he said, Look, it's still high day. It's not time for the livestock to be gathered. Water the sheep and go pasture them. In other words, Jacob's saying, Hey, it's only high noon. Get your sheep the water they need and take them back out. Let them go back out to pasture and let them eat. Sounds like he wants to hurry up and get them out of there. <laughs> okay? Um, and if you have livestock or cattle, it, it was sheep in this case, but it's all the words are interchangeable in our languages there. And he's basically saying, you know, it's not time to put them in the pasture for the night. So either Jacob was being very polite and was saying, I don't want to hinder you from your work. I realize it's only the middle of the day. Go about and do what you need to do. Or he was trying to hurry and get them away so that maybe he could meet with Rachel on his own, to meet his family on his own. Now, he's, he's not seen her yet. He does fall in love with her at first sight. We all know that, but he, you know, she's approaching. But if he's been on a long journey, he's a bit homesick. He knows he's come to his family. He knows that, that you know, God is working in all these details. He might have been becoming a bit emotional. And it might be that he didn't want his emotions, he's a man, to be seen by the others who don't even know who he is. And he's just kind of trying to get a little bit of a private meeting with the family because he knows that as he does meet them, the emotions are going to be more apt to gush. You know, when we're really lonely and really hurting and we're homesick and we get together with somebody that's going to touch that heartstring. Yeah, there can be emotion. So it could be either way, either which way. Either he was seriously meaning, please don't let me sidetrack you do your work. Or it could be he kind of wanted a private get-together as he's going to meet his family, whom God has sent him on this, this path for. Now, uh, he would not necessarily have known the custom, that they had to wait for everybody to come and open up you know, the, the um, well at the same time. But that's how they answer him, as we've already said in verse 8. They said, we cannot until all the flocks are gathered and they roll the stone from the mouth of the well, then we water the sheep. And the way this phrase there is, I'm reading it right now, if, it's, if, if it held true in the Hebrew, it does sound, Dora, kind of like there was somebody who's supposed to because they would move the stone. It either was shepherds who were coming who were stronger or a designated person or something. But anyway, there, there would be this order. 
And keep in mind that water was of great importance in, in everywhere. You know, that's why you always found the flocks around the wells. That's why when they stopped up the wells that Avram had, had um, dug, you know, there were problems. And they, people would fight over water and water rights and why Lot had to move his flocks away. You know, water was critically important. Saving it was important. Keeping it, all of that was important. Okay, so let's go on. Let's find out what happens. While he is still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. That meant that she kept her father's sheep. She tended them. And again, no coincidental meeting. This is God directing Yaakov to the very place and Rachel at the very time to come together and to meet. And how does he respond? When Yaakov saw Rachel, saw Rachel, now notice the phrase that's going to be repeated in here. The daughter of his mother's brother, Levon, and the sheep of his mother's brother, Levon. <laughs> Jacob went up and rolled the stone from the mouth of the well and watered the flock of his mother's brother, Levon. Okay, three times, Uncle Levon, you know, my mom's brother, my mom's brother, my mom's brother. Now, we aren't told why it says it, but it does make me think maybe there's an indication here of how homesick Jacob was. And what he's stressing is that he he came to, to his family. This was his mother's brother's um, um, sheep, his mother's brother, um, whatever, it says all three times. <laughs> Just like family. Okay, I'm really tongue-tied today. <laughs> So he knows he's come to the family that he's been sent to, and it is an emotional time, regardless of whatever reason you want to put into it. I see the homesickness. You know, if I can't be with my mom, if I can be with my mom's brother, there's going to be similarities there in there, the way they are, the way they do things, the way they think. You know, it's going to be a little bit of home. And, and believe me, we've all experienced that in our families where when we are homesick and we see somebody, that, that reminds us, it does touch us, it does warm us to the core. And it did, it got Yaakov all welled up <laughs> in a different way, because verse 11 says, oh, and, and notice he, he rolls the stone. Either it gave him super strength, or he was one of the strong men that could. He did roll the stone. He, he, who cares about your protocol, folks? I'm gonna take care of my family's sheep. And he, he watered the flock of his mother's brother, Laban. In verse 12, then Yaakov kissed Rachel, raised his voice, and wept. Okay, in our Hebrew, he just burst into tears. I think it was, he did, was holding back that whole tide of emotion, and it just finally gave way. And I think he was a very tender, a very loving, a very caring. Remember, he was the one that stayed in the tents. He was his mother's son. He fellowshiped with her. I think he really was missing all of that. And by this time, the separation, loneliness, you know, meeting one, and she probably exuded to him a remembrance of his mom, a tenderness, a, you know, a love, a genu uh, general love, of course, at this point. But he just, his emotions got the best of him, and he did burst out in tears. Um, verse 12, Yaakov told Rachel, and he would need to. If he's crying all over her and he's got all this emotion, <laughs> she needs to lie. He's a stranger. He said he was a relative of her father, that he was Rivka, Rebecca's son, and she ran and she told her father. She, I imagine she was excited. Oh, wow, you're, you're, you know, from our family that moved, you know, out to, to Canaan. We, you know, we, she, she would know the story. And I imagine she's singing, oh, I can't wait for my dad to know that his nephew is here. So she runs home to tell him. She's all excited to tell him. Now, we've met Levon before. Do you remember? Do you remember back in chapter 24? <coughs> Levon, Laban, and Beth, you, Beth, you well, Beth, I don't remember the name without looking at it, because um, it's not Big L, Beth, you L, um, were the leaders of the family at that time. Levon, we said, would be very young, that he was starting to take over his father's affairs and take care of things, and when it was asked, would Rebecca go? they both, in essence, were giving their permission. So we saw Levon had a role in that. He saw what Rebecca was offered, the, the um, gold 
bracelets and so forth. He saw money, he saw wealth, he knew she was going to be taken care of, and he knew they were going to get gifts for taking Rebecca, and he liked all of that. So keep that in mind. <laughs> He's also just plain hospitable, okay? So when Laban heard the news about Yaakov, his sister's son, he ran to meet him, and he embraced him, and he kissed him, and he brought him to the house. So this was a warm welcome. He was very hospitable. No doubt, Laban had missed Rebecca, and here's Rebecca's own son. You know, come, come on in, talk to us, tell us how is she, what's been going on, what's life like, you know. And I can just see him lighting up it as Jacob would share, you know, the, the time, because they didn't have phones, they didn't have ways of keeping up. You know, news would come, but it would be sporadic. Okay. Now, because I know how Levon felt in chapter 24, and I know what's coming in the future, I'm going to tell you, just don't forget, he also is a very grasping man, he's covetous, he wants, you know, wealth. We're going to see that's what's important to him. But realize how old he must be now, too. Because he was young, we think he was probably, and I'm going to just round it off, let's say around 15. Um, he would have been before 20 as he was beginning to step into taking care of his father's affairs. And if this is 100 years later, then he's now around 115 years of age again. You know, even if I backed it up to a 10-year-old, and I don't think a 10-year-old would have been helping to run the father's affairs, he'd be 110. So I'm going to say more like 115. Um, and it was 97 years ago that Rebecca left. That's a long time. It would be, wow, you know, what's happened? And then there, they'd also be thinking that Jacob will be able to tell the family what's happened with Levon. You know, so it's just, it, it's interesting how the Lord's bringing this family together, what they would be thinking. And we see the hospita hospitality of Levon as um, in his response also. So he's embraced him, he's kissed him, he's brought him to his house, verse 13. Then he, Jacob, told Levon all these things. Okay, he's bringing him up to, to par with what you know happened with the family. And verse 14, Levon said to him, You certainly are my bone and my flesh. You certainly are my nephew. You're, you're of the same family, you know, you we're blood, okay, <laughs> is what he's saying. And he stayed with him a month. In other words, oh, you are a relative, you belong, just come stay here in the house. He's convinced that this is not a stranger who is lying. This was really the son of his sister, and he wants him to, you know, stay, put him up. Just like relatives come to your house and you put them up. You don't farm them out to somebody else. Like she said, I got a hotel sometimes. Uh, right. life, yeah. You've got a hotel sometimes, oh, yeah. a family hotel, <laughs> yes. Okay, so, um, and no doubt in this time too, um, well, let me read you 15 first and then I'll say it, okay? Then Levon said to Yaakov, because you're my relative, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Okay, what's happened is a little bit of time has passed. Yeah. They've been, Jacob's been staying with them, and apparently Jacob already has been helping take care of the flocks, okay? Because he's saying, should you serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be, okay? Let's make a work deal out of this. I shouldn't just take advantage of you because you're here. I should pay you some wages. So, Jacob, what would you like your wages to be? Now, if Jacob had... Um, been attracted to someone at first sight, and obviously if he's hugging her, crying all over her, she's, she's a warm fuzzy to him. What do you think he's been doing during this probably about a month that he's been there? He's probably been helping her take care of the flocks. It would keep him close to her. They could go out and work out in the field all day and come back together and have, you know, time of talking and getting to know each other because we know by this point when he's asked, what should your wages be? Verse 16, now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah and the name of the younger was Rachel. And Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful in figure and appearance. <laughs> now Jacob loved Rachel. Oh, yeah. So he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. 
Okay, let me go back and, and tell you, fill in some of these details of what we've just been told, but I got you to the punchline. I got you to, to Jacob's already got a plan. Yeah, I, I'll work to get my wife. I want Rachel, okay? Now, uh, we, he had two daughters, Laban had two daughters. The older Leah, her eyes were weak. She was tender-eyed. In Hebrew, it says the eyes of Leah were weak. This could be an expression, and it's from the Hebrew, that could mean she wasn't pleasing to look on. She wasn't a knockout. She wasn't a, wow, you know, this is a gorgeous <laughs> one. Because our verse is talking about appearance. That's why when it says about Rachel, and I lost it, where does it say it? Um, was beautiful in figure and appearance. It, it does sound like we're talking about physical that the two daughters, Leah was plain and Rachel was a knockout, at least in Jacob's mind, okay? <laughs> it doesn't mean everybody, but at least in Jacob's mind. And at this time, the height of what's called the Oriental women, the women of the East, what was considered to be really beautiful was to have like fiery eyes, you know, those eyes that are alive and that are dancing and show spirit within them. So if Leah didn't have that kind of appearance, she wasn't captivating by sight, that's why they would refer to it as weak-eyed. It was just the way that they talked about it at that time, and Rachel's beauty would have exceeded her sister's. Now, honestly, beauty is an eye of the beholder, but in every family there are differences, and there are those who are more attracted to more people and those who are, you know, who it doesn't quite um, catch their fancy. So Rachel, by appearance, has caught Jacob's fancy, but he's also been working with her. He likes her as a person also, and he says that he's willing to work seven years for her. Now, why was he, how did he pick out that seven years? What made him think to go to that number? And if you don't Completion. know Hebrew culture, you don't know the answer to that. Completion. That's what we know stands for in scripture, a completion of perfection. But in the Hebrew culture, a Jewish slave, one who had, had to indenture himself to another because of a debt, he would serve as that slave for up to seven years. At the seven-year mark, they were set free. There was, it was, um, it, it it was the, the jubilee, it was the year of jubilee, it was the year when they would be released from their indebtedness. So he's proposing, I will indebt myself, I will be a bond servant or a bondsman for Rachel, the whole, the maximum time that it could be. I could have to do that for seven years if I had indebted myself at the beginning and, and there were seven years before that next time of freedom then I could have to pay off my debt, you know, for seven years. So he just took it to that. He's, he wasn't going to look at it and say, well, some only have to work a year and then they get free. No, <laughs> he's saying, I'll take it, I, I'll do the most that I could have to do as a Jewish person with another Jewish person. I'll make myself your indebted servant for seven years. And that would make up for the fact that there wasn't a dowry. He didn't have anything to offer Rachel, like when the servant came and he had all kinds of jewels and things to give the family and, and all of that that was part of that culture. So since Jacob didn't have anything to give, he says, well, I'll work for her. I'll give you seven years free labor for her. And Laban thinks, hmm, do I like this answer? Well, he says, verse 19, it's better that I give her to you than to another man. Stay with me. Now, what's he mean? I'd rather give her to a relative, to somebody I know, so I know she's going to fare well, than to give her to a stranger. So, stay with me. We'll make the deal. Question. And then he thought, hmm, I could use another seven years. <laughs> <laughs> what's your question? Do you know why seven years? That's what I'm questioning. Is That's it? what I just, when you slipped out oh, of the okay. room, <laughs> I'll just do it. that a Jewish person could in, indenture themselves as a slave, as a bond servant to another Jewish person to pay back a debt owed. The maximum time that that could happen is for seven years because every seven years, 
all debts were forgiven and there was a freedom. So he's going to act as if it was year one and I'll give you the whole seven years. It's the most he could possibly uh, owe of himself to another Jewish person. So I'll be your servant for the seven years. So, uh, and Levon saying, well, I'd rather give her to you than to a stranger. And actually, this is still done with the Bedouins, with the Druze, with um, other eastern tribes, you know, in those areas. They still deal in this kind of way, you know, like this. And I even remember our first trip in Israel when we were in an Arab area. I had, um, I was young and my roommate was young. And uh, we had just happened to walk out of the hotel area together and an Arab took a liking to my roommate. And my roommate's father was nearby and apparently he presumed him to be the father and he offered on the spot 40 camels for her. <laughs> we were told by our guide that was quite a compliment, 40 was a good number. <laughs> but uh, her father spoke up and said, no, she's mine and no matter how many camels, she's, she's going home with me too. <laughs> but it, it's, still, yeah, it's still the culture, it's still what's, what goes on in, in those areas now. I'm trying to figure where to quit because we're quitting for two weeks. Um, let me just take it through verse 20 right here. So Yaakov, Jacob, served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him like only a few days because of his love for her. He was willing. He put action to his words, and he didn't mind because he was serving for the love of his life. I'll put it that way. So, so, yes, here we go. We all know we're going to go into treachery. We know that, that the plot thickens. We know that there's twists and turns. So I'm just going to throw out a few things to you. We do know that he doesn't get Rachel. We know that um, Laban pulls a sneaky one on him. But how does he do that? How does he manage to do that? And, again, we're going to look at the time, the culture, what was going on. Um, because there's a marriage feast, how long does it last, and how did Levon pull this off and was able to replace Rachel with, um, yeah, replace Rachel with Leah. Um, we'll look at all that goes on. I will tell you some things we can answer and some things we can't. Was Leah a willing party? Was Leah forced to do it? Had no voice in the matter. There's different opinions on different sides. So I'll tell you, if you want to study ahead, if you have missed class next week, read through what happens in the next few verses. Go down. Um, I'd go down to verse 31. By verse 31, we're going to, we've got both girls married to Jacob, and we've got <laughs> the, the tribes beginning. And I'll tantalize you with this. Leah and Rachel named the sons. Did they just name them? Or do those names have significance also? Very interesting what we'll find out of the names of the sons. So when you come back with me, we'll talk about a Jewish marriage feast. We'll talk about what happened. We'll answer a few questions and we'll raise a few questions because we really won't know everything until we get to talk to them face to face and have a one day and say, how close were we to being right? <laughs> Did you? Didn't you? Could you? You couldn't. We'll answer all those questions to the best of our ability, but we'll, we'll leave that. We'll bring it a little more to life when we understand some of the background in it, and then we'll get into those sons and how their names are highly significant. Okay? So, God's in every detail. Even named one who was not in the Jewish line was a Persian and even named him 150 years before he would be born, saying it was the man that God was going to use. I'm talking about Cyrus, the one who was king of, of the, the Persians at one point in time that God foretold 150 years in advance what his name was going to be. And all I can think is when Mama gave birth, and she's holding her precious little son. Did she know? How did she know? Her mother knows. God <laughs> knew. And God put in her heart, mm -hmm. I think I'll name him Cyrus. So these girls are going to name their sons, but oh, what's God saying? 
because it'll be very interesting. So I'll leave you on that. Hope that makes you want to come back. I will tell you all to have a blessed Thanksgiving in between our coming back. Um, if you're on video looking, you'll know you go two weeks now from the 15th to the 20th to the 29th. So yeah. the videos on the bit.ly site will go from November 15th to November 29th because Thanksgiving interrupted in between. Okay, so blessed Thanksgiving. I hope you're with family and loved ones and anyone who's not, let us know. We don't want anybody alone and sad and, and, and any, any of the worst. <laughs> but uh, otherwise, Lord bless you and be with you. And we'll close in prayer. And you can speak up with any questions or comments. Give me your input on uh, what's developing in our story. But uh, I don't think the last seven years that Jacob has spent there, he felt any too much like he was under... Uh, judgment. I think he was enjoying his days, even if he was working. <laughs> Lord God, thank you that you are in every detail. Thank you that your timing is perfect, and thank you that you direct our steps, whether we are aware or not. But Lord, we do want to follow. We do know that you say your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. So may we be in your word, that we might have clear direction for each and every step we take, May we long be at the well, soaking up your word, being refreshed, renewed, guided, and led by every word that proceeds out of your mouth. Thank you for the privilege of, of uh, having your roadmap for us through the word and the spirit of God within us, the Ruch HaKodesh, to guide us and lead us in all truth and direct us in all ways. Lord, we have so much to be thankful for, and we do praise and thank you for everything and for a mighty God who is perfectly in control even when our world is in the turmoil, and to know that your will will be done, your promises will be kept, you are faithful, and there is never an end to that. Oh, how we thank you and praise you forever and ever and give you all the glory you deserve. In the name of our precious Messiah, our Savior, Yeshua Jesus, our God of Israel, who is Jehovah, the strong one who is faithful, we say hallelujah. Praise ye God in Jesus' name. Amen. So you're going to be out two weeks? Yes. Me? Okay. Two weeks from today we're back. We're just missing one Wednesday. Okay. Just the day before Thanksgiving. So, questions, comments? Open mics. Open mics. Oh, open mics, please. <laughs> yes, open the mics.